Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening seminar with uh, two very distinguished speakers. I should highlight to the audience in the room that there are microphones above your head, so every uh, thing you say will be picked up and transmitted uh, to the rest of the world. Um, I should also highlight for the audience online that, of course, it's a webinar, so you can ask questions via the Q&A. And of course, here in the room, we can ask questions uh, in the room. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our two very distinguished speakers. Um, uh, our uh, guests uh, to the faculty is His Excellency Jao Walade Ameda, who uh, was the EU ambassador to the United Kingdom um, uh, between uh, 2020 and 2022. Before that, he had a very distinguished 40-year career in the European institutions, uh, for example, between 2015 and 2019, uh, he was ambassador of the European Union to the United Nations. Um, Zhao will talk to us about the EU-UK relationship uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, evening seminar. And here to my right, uh, we have uh, Professor Eleanor Sharpston, who is a longtime friend of uh, the faculty of law. Indeed, uh, she joined the Faculty of Law in 1992 and uh, worked here until her appointment to the um, uh, Court of Justice of the European Union in, in, as Advocate General of the Court. And she has now returned just for this academic year as a good art professor in the Faculty of Law. Uh, she also, uh, at some point, she was the most senior um, uh, female judge of uh, the United Kingdom uh, in the international institutions and uh, will have a lot to say to us about the UK, the EU, relationship um, in the process. So we are structuring this as a conversation and uh, that will be followed by a Q&A. Um, and we're going to have sort of three points of departure. So first, I'd like to hear our speakers on their view backwards. The, um, uh, maybe a reflection on the history. How did we get to the status quo that we have today? Then in a second round, we're going to look at the status quo, the um, trade and cooperation agreement, the so-called TCA. And then in the third round, we're going to uh, use a gigantic crystal ball in order to look to the future. Uh, so, without further ado, Zhao, how, what is your impression how we got to the current status quo? Well, well, thank you, thank you very much. I'm the, the pleasure and honor of being a visiting fellow at uh, Trinity and soon after at Peterhouse. For 40 years of diplomatic life, I can guarantee you no type, no jacket, that's absolutely great. But more importantly, it allows me to share my experience and, and learn more from you than I've been doing since I arrived here, also from my colleagues, but also from uh, bright uh, young minds like, like yours. So I'm here in that approach. Uh, my impressions are not good. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brexit is a lose-lose operation, and I'm not shy about it. Now that I have total freedom of speech, uh, I can tell you that I don't think this is a good idea. 
and it has not proven to be a better idea than what I thought it was back in 2016 or the years after. Uh, but uh, and Marcus asked me to tell you how I felt. I was ambassador to the United Nations, so I was in New York uh, with a few hours uh, gap. And I went to bed relatively relaxed, thinking that Britain, British citizens will make the right decision. I woke up uh, with the wrong decision, in my view, having been taken. And I can tell you that was a difficult day, you know, for someone that worked most of its professional life for the European project that believed in it. Uh, this was a major blow for, for people like me, and I believe for the European Union. It's the first time that the country leaves. We were used to get countries joining all the time, still today, wanting to join long queue of candidate countries. And then suddenly one decides uh, not the founding member, but still after 47 years of marriage, uh, overnight, uh, wake up in the morning, I want to go, bye-bye, and that's it. So the impression was, uh, you know, I, I, I noted down and I saw my notes, I was sad, I was disappointed, disappointed, and I was slightly angry as well, because I think that uh, at the time, and throughout the years, the European Union had been able to accommodate a number of British specificities, a British requests, British opt-outs, British exclusions from a number of uh, other uh, programs and decisions that have been taken and agreed by the other members. So, so sort of carrying out a, a specific place in the European Union. Uh, some of us even thought that it was excessive. Uh, some member states were slightly jealous of the prerogatives of Britain, uh, but still, with all that, in their baggage, uh, uh, British citizens, British voters uh, decided to. So we were sort of, you know, impacted by it to be to be mild in my in my expression. This being said, regret, but respect. And uh, when I arrived here as the first EU ambassador after Brexit, on Brexit Day, actually I came two days before to make sure. They will let me in, but uh, that's a joke. Uh, and uh, my, my point was, listen, we regret, but we fully respect. And I'm not here to make you change your mind. I'm not here to campaign for rejoining. I'm here to make sure that we implement what we have agreed and that we make the best out of uh, the decision you democratically and legitimately took. That was my, my approach on this side. Uh, of the channel. On the other side of the channel, just to complete, on the EU side, I think the main concern was contagion. The main concern was to contain the damage. I mean, we're not going to have another member state thinking about leaving, right? Uh, and this process should not let others to conclude that it's maybe better to leave than to stay in. So, no contagion, quite an obsession. Let's prevent that from happening. <laughs> Uh, but also, linked to that, retreat should not be a reward. But, I mean, a departure of, of a member state should not be made at the detriment, at the cost, for those who decided to continue together in the same, in the same adventure. And of course, thirdly, obviously, defend our interests, financial interests, policy interests, trade interests, investment interest, you, you name it. Uh, and to, to do all this, our other section was to remain, stay united. We knew that unity was a condition for success in this difficult negotiation that we were about to start, and we're talking about 16 to, to 19. Um, then we had very tough negotiations, and I think for you studying it sort of backwards and retrospectively, this was one of the toughest negotiations that we had to enter because, first of all, it was the first time ever. These were uncharted waters. As I said earlier, no other country had left the European Union. We were used to negotiate accession of member states. This time we were negotiating a departure, a withdrawal. And of course, the Ukraine was not used to it either because they had never they had hesitated in joining, but they had never left before. Mm -hmm. So this was new for both sides, and the negotiation was tough. 
My, my impression from that time of them being again very close and frank is that we were about to prepare for the British side. Uh, and I'm glorifying the European Union. We are far from perfect, as you know, and I fully admit. But in this particular case, I think we, we were better prepared. Uh, and my, uh, my, one of my considerations is that I don't think those who won the referendum were ready for the result of the referendum. I don't think some of them even thought they would win the referendum. And I'm sure that none of the main actors was prepared or had a clear plan on how to implement the result of the referendum. That's me guessing in my, my academic freedom. Uh, uh, but that's, that's the impression I have retrospectively uh, that uh, the union was at the end of the day better prepared. I mean, it has to do with the volatility of the political scene in Britain. Remember those days between, you know, David Cameron, by the way, he's back. <laughs> uh, David Cameron followed by Theresa May, followed by Boris Johnson. Uh, and this was a very, you know, I was watching this from, from New York, but you were certainly closer to it, how dramatic it was. Uh, and it ended in, in an election, which was sort of rushed through and, 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 and decided at the last moment. So there were links between the negotiations and the electoral political process inside Britain. And one thing may explain the other and, and vice versa. So uh, the, the, the fact is that we concluded a number of agreements, a withdrawal agreement, which was, you know, contain the terms of divorce, you know, who sees the kids and who walks the dog kind of situation. Uh, and then the trade and cooperation agreement, which was, you know, the framework for our future relations. Uh, we were very keen on the sequence. We wanted to settle the divorce issues first and then the future. And this was a smart move, I recognize, retrospectively, because it gave us a clear sort of comparative advantages in the, in, the, in the dynamics of the process. And then we, uh, and I was already in, in London at that time, we negotiated uh, the trade and cooperation agreement, the, the terms of our future. And that's what, we, that's where we are in the, in the, and I'm trying to summarize something that uh, it's difficult to summarize in a few years time. So a, little, a, a very strong sort of negative impression uh, on the day of Brexit and the first months after it, a, a, call, a call for arms, you say, a call of arms, and you say, need, uh, inside the European Union to get our acts together, a difficult negotiation, ending with uh, fundamentally two agreements, but an important element concerning Northern Ireland. And this is important because it was a major issue of, uh, of confrontation during my time in London. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, the Windsor framework that tried to uh, sort out a few issues we got in Northern Ireland. We can talk about that later on. And that's where we are today. And I'll stop here. Excellent, Jao. Thank you very much. Eleanor, you had a slightly different vantage point, but no less dramatic. Thanks, Marcus. Yes, well, I, I did have a, a different vantage point and a distinctly uncomfortable one because I was, of course, sitting inside the Court of Justice of the European Union trying to get on with what unquestionably was my dream job, the pinnacle of my professional existence, namely serving as an advocate general. And I had joined the court in 2006. I'd asked to be renewed in 2009. I had asked again to be renewed in 2015. And of course, at that stage, there was not a cloud on the horizon, not even a small cloud the size of a man's hand. So I was renewed and I settled down with my nice team. Here we are, we've got another lovely six years to write opinions, won't this be great? Because we, we had a very good time together as a team. And then it became clear that there would be a referendum because the Conservative Party had an outright majority in the election. Had there been another coalition, I think the betting, I do not know any of this from the inside, and I am also enjoying my academic freedom. But had there been a coalition, <clears throat> my suspicion is that if the coalition partners had been the Liberal Democrats, 
they would have prevented there being a, re a referendum, and that, that may have been part of the political calculus of Mr. Cameron going into the election, because he came out of the election with the majority, and therefore a referendum had to be delivered. The referendum that was delivered, the particular form of referendum, was, of course, a particular choice. In a country which had a written constitution, something which was so fundamental by way of challenge would probably have required a supermajority. Other aspects that in the event didn't get addressed include, would it have been a good idea to make sure that all the constituent parts of the United Kingdom felt the same way about leaving or remaining? What about the young voters in the Scottish referendum those who were younger than voting age were given the right to vote exceptionally because it was felt this was about their future. And that was a suggestion, but one that did not find favour. And of course, there were a number of British nationals who had exercised free movement rights and were to be found scattered throughout the EU and who were therefore, by reason of having spent more than 15 years away from the UK, who didn't have a right to vote, shall we give them the right to vote? Because this is also very much about their future. None of those things. It was a straight vote and it was a straight majority. And the ballot paper was deceptively simple because it said, do you want to leave or do you want to stay? But there was no definition of what leaving was going to mean. And very probably, a fair proportion of those who voted leave did not have a very specific idea in their mind as to what they were going to do. I mean, staying was clear enough, we know what staying means, but what we think was going to mean was less precise, it was more opaque. I did have a bad feeling about this in the run up to the referendum in the sense that I know how many decades we have had of tabloid smears about the EU. The Daily Mail has been saying nasty things about the European Union for as long as I can remember. And so I didn't feel a sense of certainty that it would be all right. I was actually in Sweden on the morning when the result came through, and my Swedish friends came up to me very solemnly, and they patted me on the shoulder and shook my hand or embraced me as though there had been a death in the family. And that struck me very much. There really was regret at the result. Well, you'll appreciate the sitting inside the court. I was hardly about to take any public position. I watched in growing surprise and then almost disbelief as the UK stumbled its way towards the hardest version of Brexit that it could find. And that did surprise me because in my naivety, I had assumed that the economic interest, for example, of retaining access to the single market, would at least get discussed seriously. I mean, I got the idea, we don't want the bigger political project, we want more control, you know, all of that's clear. By the way, something that was never clear to me is why the proposed special arrangements that David Cameron brought back from Brussels in February 2016, never really got looked at in any serious way. And that astonished me, because speaking as a, somebody who's an EU lawyer, I can say that the level of legal craftsmanship involved in what was put on offer for the UK was extraordinary. It was alpha, triple plus. It was two very, very bright actually bright English lawyers, one on either side of the discussion, taking matters what almost felt to the outer edge of what was possible to do under the treaties in order to try to meet what was perceived to be the main concern, the free movement concern. And that never really got looked at in any serious way when it was brought back to London. And again, that was a rather negative signal in terms of where this was likely to go. Anyway, I sat there in Luxembourg and I watched, as did my two colleagues on the court. 
And we watched as red lines were painted on the floor, a red line about the single market, another red line about the customs union. Then there was, of course, the problem of Northern Ireland, because if you take the UK out of the EU, there is a land frontier between the EU and the third country. I mean, that is a simple geographical fact. And along with the land frontier, there were also all the uncomfortable echoes of past problems. Everything to do with the troubles, as they were euphemistically called in English speak. <clears throat> troubles is a really British understatement for people getting shot and kneecapped. They were called the troubles. But the troubles were sold by the Good Friday Agreement because the UK and the Republic of Ireland were both EU member states. And it was that that enabled this kind of slate of hand, whereby if you were Protestant in Northern Ireland, it was fine because you were still part of the United Kingdom. And if you were Republican, actually the frontier between the North and the South ceased to matter. So that was going to have to be addressed. And something that really surprised me, uh, I say this as somebody who's half Irish, but something that really surprised me was that the potential problems of Northern Ireland, somehow it was there on the map, but nobody really looked at it very hard. And where you put the border, which was really a serious issue, was, was almost dismissed in a series of, of kind of one-liners. I do agree with a lot that you want to say, ranging from this was a lose-lose operation through to the fact that the UK had a tailor-made arrangement as the member state, a kind of saddle row suit, you know, not an off-the-peg Marks and Spencer suit, but a saddle row tailoring, which you like the lapels a little wider, what about some buttons on this cuff? Double-breasted, single-breasted, two buttons, three, absolutely tailor-made. Cashmere wool. Cashmere wool. <laughs> absolutely. Cashmere wool. Finest quality cashmere. Perhaps a little more hair in there as well, I'm not sure. And I will absolutely agree that the winners weren't prepared. That became painfully obvious. And as it became obvious, and as the rhetoric in London backed out about it's a red, white, and blue Brexit, my sense was that it became more toxic. The EU had very clear objectives. They knew what they needed. They needed containment. They needed to make sure they stayed united. Retreat was certainly not going to be rewarded. By the way, that's different from giving punishment beatings. It's not the same thing at all. It's just saying, look, we need to look after our interests. And you said you want to leave with the club, so we will look after our interests during the process of your leaving. But really and truly, the EU was better prepared. They knew what they were trying to do, whereas I never really got the sense throughout the process that there was a kind of unified feeling on the UK side. We do know where we're going, and this is exactly what we want. And so, well, my, my colleagues at the court and I sat and watched this. It did feel a little bit, I apologize for the over-dramatization, but it did feel a little bit like being a dip officer on the Titanic. <laughs> because you knew that the ship had hit the last iceberg. And you knew it was going to sink on you. And you knew you were going down to the ship. But in the meantime, you were, of course, a serving officer and you were meant to carry on doing your duty. And so my colleagues, my judge colleagues, Christopher Biker in my court, Ian Forrester in the general court, my judge colleagues carried on contributing to deliberate, preparing draft judgments. And I carried on writing opinions and indeed, as the shredding was kept at the good general, I even issued a number of opinions after Brexit. Thank you very much, uh, Eleanor. Um, and so, you know what, in the interest of time, I think we should move to the status quo, your analysis, and also the question, what could be the future um, going forward? And then, We'll enter the Q&A. 
Chuck, what's yeah. your analysis of the status quo? Well, Chuck, just be brief because it's, it's complex. Uh, so we have these three agreements, right? The, the withdrawal agreement uh, dealt with the, the financial settlement, how much one pays, and that, that is being implemented without any problem. Then we have the issue of the expatriates, the city, our citizens here and the British citizens in our 27 member states. Uh, and you follow that, the settled status and all that. Uh, just for curiosity, when I write in London and ask my team, how, how many are we? By we, meaning EU citizens. Well, we don't know, but roughly 3 million. At the end of the settled status process, we had registered more than 6 million. Well, that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the EU presence in the UK, but also the you know, volatility of the numbers, uh, because people are not forced to register. You don't have in Britain an identity, national identity card kind of thing. So uh, at the end of the day, this was a long process that took a lot of time and energy, and we were able to settle people, give them a, a, a stable status here. It was quite a successful operation. The same happened in our member states. These were the two elements. The third element was, as Leo was saying, uh, the Northern Ireland program. I mean, uh, you know, I had endless discussions on this, endless interviews on TV and elsewhere, debates, and you, you name it. Uh, and my point was very simple. The protocol is not the problem. The problem is Brexit. The protocol attenuates, uh, how do you say, uh, reduces the impact, the negative impact of Brexit. Because Brexit didn't, yeah, and Northern Ireland, they don't live together well for the reasons they were explained. There are 260, I guess, uh, I don't know many kilometers, but I know there are 260 points of entry between, or passage between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, you know, if if we had not reached an agreement about how to handle that border, we would have to close the border. Imagine putting a fence uh, for all the reasons that later. So we had to solve the problem. So it was not the EU wanting to create a problem for the Britain. It was Britain's choice of Brexit and the kind of Brexit, no single market or customs unit, that created the Northern Ireland. And the, the protocol was the way agreed by both, by the way, uh, to solve the problem. The problem being that once we started implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol, we're talking about 2021 and 22, uh, the problem started to arise on the British side, basically saying, we don't like this protocol, uh, it uh, creates more problems than it solves, and basically we are ready to unilaterally uh, not respect the protocol, which they did several times. Uh, and that created a very bad feeling in Brussels and in our capitals. Uh, the levels of trust went down dramatically, and these were very difficult years. Uh, throughout the negotiation of the TCA, in parallel, we had these problems about the protocol. And once we made the TCA, uh, already in 21, we had major issues. Uh, you may remember the internal market bill, a minister in parliament saying, uh, uh, this, uh, this, with this bill, uh, the UK would not respect uh, international law, but that's not true. Only in a very specific, in a very specific, and limited way. Uh, and you know, it does create a good atmosphere if you sign one piece of, of international law, which became UK law and EU law. And six months later, you say, oh, after all, I don't like it that much, and I'm going to take steps unilaterally not to uh, implement. And this was a major issue, which was solved by the Windsor framework uh, uh, a couple of uh, years later. That's the first point I want you to, to retake, is that the, our relationship has been negatively impacted by the very low levels of trust that were uh, created by the attitude of the British government throughout this time. I'm talking about the bodies uh, Johnson and Listras uh, government. Things improved with Rishi Sunak, a, a different attitude, a different mindset, a different approach, which led eventually to the sacking of the Windsor framework. The second aspect that, of course, determines the state of play today is the red lines that are in the, in the system. 
and that will impact upon the future. The choice made by the UK is a very hard kind of Brexit, meaning no single market, no customs. We draw from a number of programs uh, in the European Union, including Erasmus, uh, but not only. Uh, mean that whatever we do now and in the future is limited by the very narrow level of ambition of the initial British position, right? Uh, so this cannot be forgotten in terms of how we uh, move forward. So we are now implementing this agreement, implementing the Windsor framework, and I want to believe that it will be fully implemented. Uh, let's see how, how it goes. Uh, and we are looking at ways and means to, within the trade and cooperation agreement, which is again the treaty that establishes the framework for our relations, if we can go forward on a number of, on a number of areas. One of them is relevant for you, which is youth mobility. We are looking at ways and means to facilitate what has been made very difficult by uh, the British negotiating positions. We draw from Erasmus, uh, you know, you have you know, much less European students uh, in UK universities uh, than you have before. The fees went up tremendously. But is there a way for us, for instance, to, to bring down the fees for European students in Britain and British students in Europe? I think we are open to that. I hope the British authorities are as well. Can we find ways of, uh, again, allowing youth mobility schemes? I see that there are already, there's already progress about French uh, high school students coming to, to, uh, to the UK. I mean, let, let's be clear on this. If there is one victim of Brexit, is young people. In terms of access, opportunities, mobility, uh, uh, tourism, uh, summer jobs, au pairs, all that has been made extremely more difficult. For what reason, one could ask? What is the strategic fundamental interest on, on, to, to make this more difficult? So I hope that in this area, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can do uh, something also more constructive and positive in the area of energy, uh, where we have fundamentally, you know, complementary, if not common, common interest, and a couple of other areas where maybe we can, uh, within the present framework, do better. And I want my last point here is to say, uh, for, for sort of maximizing what we have today, is making sure that the structures we built to manage the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, TCA, are fully used as a tool to sort out disputes, prevent problems from arising, they were created for that. And I, I, you know, there are dozens of committees and subcommittees. Uh, colleagues of mine and, and colleagues of the UK sit on those committees. Their job is to find solutions to prevent problems. And I think there's a, a scope there for us within the framework. I'm not talking about retrying. I'm not talking about and another negotiation. I'm, I'm referring to the existing framework allowing us to go further in a number uh, in a number of areas using uh, the DCA uh, framework um, but but as Neil said I mean you are either pregnant or not so you are either inside the single market or not uh, it's very difficult to conceive a uh, halfway situation in which you have part of the single market, but not, uh, you have the benefits, but not the responsibility. You have a partial, but not total uh, free circulation, for instance. Uh, you know, there are, as I said, limitations imposed by the, the, the relevance uh, chosen by the, by the United Kingdom. And this is something that it's very difficult to, to escape from. But this being said, I'm optimistic that if there is goodwill, uh, and now that the trust, the level of trust has have gone up to a reasonable level, I think we can, uh, we can uh, you know, make things work a little bit. I know that most likely there will be elections in this country 
I'd say 12 months time or something like that, the one to get into the, the British political debate. Uh, we will have to see what kind of government comes up for the next elections, what their position will be about the borough. There's direct elections in Europe next year as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see what comes up with that. And if, if, if we start a new discussion or not, but maybe we can talk about that when we talk about more about the future. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, can we make things work? I don't know. Well, I'm going to pick up directly on the question of trust and trustworthiness. And I am going to tell you that as an English lawyer working in an EU institution, working with colleagues from other member states, I was embarrassed and ashamed to watch my country's government moving away from everything which I thought I knew the UK represented in terms of trustworthiness. It is difficult to overstate the damage that was done by the diminution by the practical, dis practical disappearance of trustworthiness. Listening, as Jean said, listening to a British minister in Parliament saying, yes, I know that the Internal Market Bill breaks international law. I know it's inconsistent with what we've signed up to. But that's all right. Parliament is sovereign. And it only breaks it in a limited and specific way. Well, it's like the old story of very old and not particularly politically correct now, but in the 19th century, there is the mistress of the house and she is berating one of the maids who has fallen pregnant. And the maid says, please, ma'am, it's only a little one. You know, it's only going to be a little baby. Well, I mean, you're either, you have your word as your bond or it isn't. There's no such thing as breaking your law in a specific and limited way. And that really did, that unassociated attitudes did so much damage. And I want to mention something here, which I'm sorry, it's blindingly obvious, but it bears saying. You know something, many people on the other side of the channel read English. No, but really, <laughs> consequently, we do our best. Consequently, <laughs> If, let's suppose that the UK had been Lithuania, all right, the number of people, I picked the other half of my family now, the number of people who read Lithuanian is relatively limited. It's a very difficult language. So if it had been Lithuania leaving, it might have been possible for Lithuanian politicians to say some things for home consumption which would only really have been read in Lithuania, or would only have had wide currency in Lithuania. And then they would have said other things in the negotiations with the EU and Brussels. You can't do that with English, because anything that is said at a political meeting in the UK, anything that is reported in the UK press, is going to be read by the people on the other side of the negotiating table. And this is... I apologize for stating a blindingly obvious fact, but you know, apparently, apparently it was not so obvious. <laughs> Where have we actually got to? Well, I'm very happy to hear Jean say that he thinks the level of trust is going back up to a reasonable level. I hope it is, because I think that that has to be the starting point for doing anything sensible with the status quo, and that that is true in spades as regards the future. In terms of doing things with the status quo, there are things that can be addressed. As you said, there is there are all the structure of the TCA. There are all these committees. There are all these places to discuss things. There are things, yes, there are red lines which arise from a limited vision of the relationship. But there are some things that can be addressed because, yes, indeed, young people are really the losers on Brexit, but there's some other losers. Let me, let me mention a group, let me mention musicians. 
we mention people, whether they're classical musicians or they're modern musicians, it used to be possible, as you started off in your career, it used to be possible to get a gig somewhere on the continent, to go off, to go off with the orchestra or go off with your group, pack your gear into a lorry, take it with you. It was all so easy. It has become incredibly difficult and cumbersome and expensive to do what was previously very easy. And it doesn't have to stay like that. It could be explored, it could be investigated. Some of the really hard, hard edges could be softened. But of course, there are red lines there. Now, you probably want to enter the future to talk about what the TCA does or doesn't allow, so I'll, I'll stop yes. it. I'll stop it. Um, well, maybe we can, uh, just in the interest of time, open it up to what you've already heard and then weave it into the answer to the question what, yeah. where we think uh, the negotiations or uh, reform of the TCA could be going. Any questions 